morning. See if this, that microphone is a little squirrely this morning. Hey, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at City Church. Such a joy to be able to worship together with you. Um, if you are a guest with us, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of 1 John. Um, it's a letter that we are studying. And I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this. And go this way. There we go. Much better. All right. Um, much better for you. Not so much better for me. I like to talk with my hands, and now I've got one occupied. So um, you just have to bear with me on that front. But no, it's so good to uh, be together with you um, and uh, continuing in our study in the book of First John. If you uh, were not with us last week, um, we started chapter 4, and we're going to pick up in the middle of chapter 4 this morning. Um, where John is going to uh, turn back to a familiar theme that we have seen throughout this book, um, and that is the theme of love and our call to love one another. You might remember that um, a few weeks ago when we started chapter 3, we saw him, uh, this exhortation uh, to love one another and how we are to live, and um, that that love for one another is rooted in the knowledge of who Christ is and what he has done for us, um, and that we are called to love one another. And he's going to, in a sense, come back to that um, after last week where he gave us this test or this calling to test the spirits to um, evaluate with whether the the messages that we hear are from God or are from the Antichrist those that would um, were kind of coming into the church at the time when John wrote this letter um, people were coming into the church the local church and trying to say that Jesus was not who he said he was they were denying the incarnation of Christ denying that Christ actually came um, and took on flesh. And as a result of that, John is writing this letter to push back against that. And of course, there are questions that arise. We have to ask ourselves, are we hearing from God or are we hearing from ourselves or are we hearing a message that is counter to Christ? And so John gave us some tests that we could use to evaluate that. And so then here, as we get to verse 7, he turns back to um, the calling to love. This is rooted, by the way, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, in that text he says this, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. In 3.23, John is giving the church, he's giving us two tests to evaluate whether or not we are Christians. You ever had to ask yourself, am I a Christian? Do I follow Jesus? Am I a Christ follower? If you ask yourself that question, John gives you the way to answer that question. The evaluation that you have to look at is 1 John 3, 23. Do you believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ? Do you believe in who Jesus is, what he has done, his work on the cross for you? Do you believe that? If you believe that, that's the first step. The second test is, and really this is the affirmation that you do truly believe those words. It's not just that you say you believe in Jesus, but that you actually believe in Jesus, that it's taken root in your soul at a spiritual level, is that you love one another. The love for one another is the evaluation that what you say is actually taken root. Many of you know my personal testimony. I've shared it many times in the life of our church. But as I was growing up, I, was, I would always tell people, I, Yes, I'm a Christian. I don't ever remember a time where I denied that I was a Christian. I don't ever remember a time in my life that I denied God. But I very much remember a time where I lived completely for myself and did not love anyone but myself. I could say that I was a Christian because I grew up in a culture that just affirmed that. I grew up in a place where you were either Christian or I don't even know what the alternative was. We were just all Christians. Not really, but that's what we believed. But then Christ came and intervened in my life, and I stopped living exclusively for myself, and the test of the affirmation that Christ had done something was that I started to love others more than I love myself. I would sacrifice, and I would do things for other people more than me. That's why John gives us this test in 323. And so as we come, that jump down to the middle of chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, we will see this calling to love. And how we are to love is going to be explained. Would you please stand out of reverence for God's word as I read 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, 
For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses Jesus that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Lord Jesus, you are the definition, the picture. You are, as this word says to us, love. Help us to know you. To know your love this morning, I pray that if there's anyone in this room who, like me, at one point might say that they are a Christian but know that they live their lives for themselves, would your love confront them this morning? Would it confound them? Would it break down the walls that surround their heart? And would you assure them of your deep love, your unending love? Would you shape us to look more like you, Jesus, and to love like you do? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So John tells us, beloved, let us love one another. As he begins this, you have seen, as we've talked about over and over again, he uses this word, beloved, but I want to raise this point that we have talked about John being that older grandfather writing to the church. He's near the end of his life, and so he writes this, and he says, and he begins with that word, beloved, that he's used throughout this letter. But one of the things that we should note is that word, beloved, is not just John expressing love as a grandfather would for his grandchildren or his family, but that love that he's saying, that beloved is, you who are loved by God, beloved, you are loved by God, let us love one another, because love is from God. Essentially, he says that if you love, then you know God. He then counters that in verse 8 by saying, if you do not love, anyone who does not love does not know God. John doesn't pull any punches. We've talked about this before. He's very straightforward, and he just very simply says, begins this passage or this section of the text by saying, if you know God, you will love one another If you love one another, that's rooted in knowing God. And if you do not know God, or if you do not love one another, then there's no way that you can know God. Because if you know God, then you know that he is love. Because God is love. That is who he is. John says that those who have been born of God will love one another. Whoever whoever loves has been born of God. John probably has in mind, as he writes this, the interaction that Jesus had with Nicodemus. You don't have to turn in your Bibles, but in John chapter 3, Jesus is meeting with a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you might remember, is a Pharisee who comes to Jesus in the middle of the night because he is of the religious elite, the religious leaders of the day. He can't go to Jesus in public. He's supposed to, you know, be confronting Jesus, and all of his friends are telling him all the reasons why Jesus isn't the Messiah, but Nicodemus, through the power of the spirit is becoming aware of who Jesus is and he comes to Jesus and he says we know that you are sent from God because we've seen the miracles that you perform we've seen what you do Jesus but I need help he doesn't understand and Jesus responds to him it'll be behind me behind me on the screens in this way in John chapter 3 verses 3 through 6 Jesus says these words truly truly I say to you unless one is born again he cannot see the kingdom of God Nicodemus said to him how can a man be born when he is old 
Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. If we come back here to 1 John chapter 4, John is making this connection to the reality of us being born again. He who has been born of God, he who is born again, the question that Nicodemus asked, that he was confused by, how can we be born again? John says, you will know that you have been born again when you love. That is how you will know and have confidence. Whoever loves has been born of God. Whoever has love for others has been raised to life in Christ. Remember, John here is countering those messengers, those antichrist messengers. I didn't say the antichrist, antichrist messengers, those who speak a message that is antichrist, counter to who Jesus is. They said that Jesus did not come in the flesh. And because of that, there was all of this sort of life that hung on that theological belief, that statement. They're teaching a false message about God, this antichrist message. But those who are born of God, they are the ones who love. And it's the love of those who are born of God that is critical, John knows, to countering this message of the Antichrist. It's because through the love of the church, through the way the church loves one another, that message that Jesus didn't come and therefore we could do whatever we wanted to do, our lives could look however we wanted them to live because our flesh can never be redeemed, there's a difference there. There's a change that has been made in those who love God so that it is a, just a confrontation to that message that, no, it doesn't matter. John says, yes, it does. The way we love matters. The way we love one another. And in verses 12 and 17, John sort of encapsulates in these two verses the heart of this passage. We're going to jump around here, so I'm going to read from verse 12 and then 17. Verse 12, he says, No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. The second statement that he makes, jumping down to 17, is, By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. Notice the word that he uses there. He uses the word perfected in both of those statements. Perfected. Now that word perfected, I sometimes, when I hear perfect, I think of, in ways, unblemished. There's no tarnish on it. It's still in perfect condition. My car, I want it to remain in perfect condition. No children allowed, right? But here, this word perfected or perfect, it literally means, more literally means, made complete. That God's love, he says, is made complete through the way we love one another to those. And so we see that perfect love has two results. What is perfect love? Perfect love is the love of God demonstrated through the incarnation of Christ. Again, directly confronting the message of the Antichrist, that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. He says that perfect love, the love that is made complete, is a love that is demonstrated through Christ. And there's two results that he references here in verses 12 and 17. In verse 12, it is this, that others would know God. Others will know God through the way we love. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is made complete, is perfected in us so that others might see and experience the love of God. That is why the body of Christ is so vital, such a picture to a world of what love is. As we love one another, I expect, I hope, Got to believe in a room this size. I say this every week. There's someone here in this room that doesn't know the love of God. Is far off from Christ. Unsure that God could love you or does love you. I'm so glad that you're here, brothers and sisters in Christ. What a joy it is for us to just be conscious of that and to see as we love one another, as we live our lives together, 
as we do the things that we do, that's, again, I know it's just a fun date night. It's got Hutch's barbecue, by the way, so that's a reason enough to show up. But on Friday night, when we come together and we hang out with one another as, as couples, it's that others might see the way we love one another. As we come together here on Sunday mornings, others see and experience, I pray, if you're a guest, that you have experienced and seen the love that this church family has for one another. It's one of my greatest hopes is that you would just see a tangible evidence of that because there is real love in this room. It is shared amongst many people. And that love is a demonstration to you. By the way, don't prop us up. That love is a demonstration of the love that we have received from the Father. And we extend that to you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our love for one another, he says, will change the world, will transform other people's lives. They might not be able to see God, but they can see God through the way we love one another. The second result of perfect love found in verse 17, is that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. He references this day. I'll come back to this in just a few moments, but he references this, and it's, there's a confidence that we gain in knowing where we stand with God, being able to answer that question. Yes, I know that I'm a Christian because I believe in Jesus and because I sincerely love others. Empowered by his spirit, I know and I have a confidence before God, not in myself, but I have a confidence in what he has done in the transformation that has taken place. John wants the church to know this love and what it looks like. It's a love that is completely fueled by Christ. That's why we say perfect love is is perfect love is the love God demonstrates through the incarnation of Christ. Without Christ, there cannot be love. If Christ had not ever come, love would not, there would not be a love like we understand it today. This is what he's referring to in verse 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love that we have, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of for our sins. Perfect love is Christ's love, is a love that is demonstrated through the incarnation of Christ because it's all about what Jesus did. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his son into the world. You probably hear John's other book, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He sent his son, and for what? To be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation, it's a big word, it's a theological word. Here's what it means. It simply means that Jesus was the satisfactory and acceptable sacrifice for the sins of the world. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was a satisfactory payment, propitiation for my sins. What Jesus did on the cross was enough to satisfy God so that his wrath no longer is directed towards me and my sinfulness, but was laid fully on the work of Christ. That's the love of Jesus, that he would do that, that Jesus would willingly lay down his life to take on that wrath. Why did Jesus pray in the garden and drops of blood drip from his brow? Why did he plead with the Father to take this cup? Because he understood he was going to become the propitiation for the sins of the world. He was going to demonstrate his love for the world as he laid his life down for us. This is the love of God. It was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that through him we might live, that we have life because of him. And we have life because Jesus was the satisfactory payment for the sins of the world when he laid down his life on the cross. Now you're saying to yourself, why does all this matter? So much on love. I skipped over this, but I don't know if you picked up on it. I bet a few of you were counting how many times I read the word love in the text that I read. 27 times. 27 times God says love in that passage. That's 27 times he says the word love in 14 verses. Pastor Matt, math major, will give you a ratio of that after the services. But that's a lot of love packed into 14 verses, all right? Why does this matter? Why is John emphasizing this love and calling us to love and reminding us of the root of love and all of these things? Well, it's because, again, he was dealing with a message that said that Jesus, what he did, didn't matter. 
It was an essentially in a denial, an antichrist message that says that Jesus did not come in the flesh. Because he didn't come in the flesh, he couldn't lay down his life on a cross. He couldn't be the propitiation for the sins of the world. He couldn't satisfy God's wrath against sin. So we needed that type of love, that intervention love of Christ in order for us to have life at all. So it matters a lot. It's a very big deal. It also matters in terms of how we live our lives together. I don't know if you hear this. I hear it often today. It's used sometimes as a refute or a rebuttal against our faith. But some will say, well, God is love. I can't believe in a God who would condemn or I can't believe in a God who might judge or who would have this against or would even speak about sins. I can't believe in that kind of a God. It's the essence, in a sense, of the message of the Antichrist, by the way. We can do whatever we want. Our sin can't be redeemed. I don't want to believe in a God that would actually condemn our flesh, and therefore I'll create some theology that gives me a little bit of a way out of that. The Antichrist people, those that were purporting those messages, by the way, they probably did things, lived in their lives that seemed loving, could have been sort of looked loving. But here's what John is saying. If it's not rooted in the message of Christ, it is not love. Love, because God is love, is always rooted in the message of the gospel. We know this to be true in our own lives. I buy your coffee as I'm waiting in George's line. You're behind me, so I just say, hey, I'm going to pick up the tab on your, or I ask him how many there are first, and then I say, how, you know, <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll buy that. See right there? That's kind of how, how selfish I am, right? But that's the flesh. I'm going to buy your coffee, and as soon as I pull through, I start thinking to myself, well, I kind of wonder, uh, I wonder who will buy my coffee the next time. Maybe that will come around for me. You know, maybe something good will happen to me. Immediately, we, we can't really even do anything generously without our flesh sort of raging against us. I'm going to act like I love you to your face, and then behind your back, I'm going to go and gossip about you. These are the things that they, there's actions that seem loving, but we know actions that are not rooted in the love of Christ are always going to be tainted by our sin, going to be tainted by our flesh. And so it's not simply that we would do things that look loving to the world, but that our love would be rooted in what we know of God and would be rooted in what Christ has done for us. God is love. His love is always rooted in, points to, is driven by the person of Jesus Christ. Everything that God does is rooted in that kind of love. God is love, and his love is seen in Jesus. This is what we see in a passage of Scripture often used in wedding ceremonies from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And yes, this can apply to our marriages and our relationships even outside of marriage with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. But this passage of scripture found in 1 Corinthians 13 is about Jesus. That's who this word is about. And in this word about Jesus, he defines love for us. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful, even when they don't buy you a cup of coffee. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. That is Jesus. Every word of that is who Jesus is. Jesus is the one who is patient and kind in the midst of my sinfulness. Jesus is the one who did not envy or boast in his holiness, but willingly laid down his life as a sacrifice for my life. He isn't arrogant or rude. He never met a sinner in an arrogant way and said, get away from me, but he received them and accepted. Every person that approached him was met with a gentleness and a kindness and an approachability. Did not insist on his own way. Pleaded with the Father, take this cup from me, but then not my will, but your will be done, Father. Not irritable or resentful. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's on the cross, and he says, forgive those who just put me there. That's love. Rejoices with the truth. Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. 
And it's Jesus who is the one who bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Every word of this, love never ends, Jesus never ends. He is the eternal son of God who loves. How are we to love when we don't know Christ? It's impossible. And every act of love that is true love is going to be rooted in the message, in the work, in the person of Jesus because he is, as the word says, love. The perfect love, then, this love, this understanding that we see in Christ, the perfect love of God's people reveals God. Again, back to verses 11 and 12. Beloved, if God so loved us, We also ought to love one another. No one has seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and love is perfected in us. Here's the message. Yes, they haven't seen God. How can they know that he exists? How can they know that God is real? Because they've seen God's people. They've seen God's people loving one another. And every, here's what is true. The world knows when there's something unique about the love that exists with, amongst God's people. They see that love, again, in the same way that my hope for you, if you're here as a guest or sort of peering into our family of God this morning, is that you see that. And my guess is, is that you do in some way, if you've come back a second time, if you're going to go to 101 in this next hour, the reason that you have any interest, any intrigue about who we are, it's not because we've done anything special. It's not because... There's anything unique about us. It's because if there is something unique, it's that you've experienced the love that we have for one another. You see that love. You've experienced that love. The perfect love of God's people reveals God. Well, it's not only good for others that they see God in us and therefore can respond and recognize God, but again, John gives us and repeats the confidence that this gives us there in verse 13. He says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. John doesn't want you I don't want any of us to doubt, to go to bed worried about whether we know God and God knows us. And the love that we have, that love rooted in Christ, the knowledge of who Christ is, the knowledge of what he has done, that he is the son of God, that he did lay down his life for you, that knowledge gives us a confidence. We don't have to carry those burdens I know we talk about burdens, and there are many burdens that you may be experiencing, whether it's grief or loss or family dynamics. There's a million things, job situations, friend situations that aren't going great, not sure about directional things. Maybe tomorrow morning you've got a decision that you've got to make, and you're thinking about all of those things. All of those burdens are heavy. I understand that. But the deepest rootedness of those burdens is, do I know God? Does he know me? Because if God knows me, then maybe there's something for me. Maybe he has a plan for me. Maybe he'll help me with this. And John says, I don't want you to have to worry about that foundational question. And we know we can have confidence in our knowledge of God and that he knows us and that we are his children by, again, those two things, that we believe in Jesus and that we love one another. That love that is a picture of Christ's love is a spirit-empowered thing. That's why he says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Sometimes people encourage me. I'm really grateful for the encouragement. One of my favorite quotes is, no one ever died of over-encouragement. Periodically when I receive that encouragement, it's something that's encouraging about a word that I might have shared or something I said either here or on a more personal level or those types of things. I always think to myself, "If you, I just want you to know it's not from me. <laughs> that's the spirit of God at work through me. It's not from me. Confidence before God, that type of confidence eliminates fear. This is another effect of the perfect love. The perfect love of God's people eliminates fear. Verse 17, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence 
for the day of judgment. Not only confidence in our own souls and a peacefulness as we lay our heads down on our pillows, but also a confidence that when the day of judgment comes, we do not have to fear that day. Judgment day is a real day. There will be a day where the world will account for its sinfulness before a holy God. And that judgment is real, but it's not a day that for believers, those of us who confess that Jesus is the Christ, confess that he is who he says he was, did what he says he did, all of those things to be true about Jesus and have demonstrated our love for one another, we don't have to have fear. We don't fear judgment day. Rather, we look forward to that day because that day, if not preceding it by our own physical death, that day will be a day where we're united with Christ forever. We don't have to have fear. And the love that we demonstrate for one another, John says, tells us that we do not have to fear that coming day. There is no fear in love, but perfect love. Completed love, love rooted in Christ, casts out fear. Your children, I don't know if you have ever used this, parents, but sometimes there's a punishment that you can put out there for them, and that will direct their course, fear of punishment. Anybody else? I'm the only parent that ever has used that carrot, I guess, or that stick. Well, here's what I can tell you. I'll just confess this about myself. I strive to drive according to the legal limits of the law on the road. Now, I don't do that because I actually enjoy going that slow. The reason I do that is because I can't afford the insurance hike. There's a punishment levied out there that I'm just, I'm, I'm going to just try to steer clear of that. I, I know you're thinking, you skip way past all the safety. and the other, I know, it's just about the money. Here, there's that selfishness coming through again. But there's that punishment that is out there that sometimes directs us or can shape us. John says... We don't have to fear judgment. The love of Christ at work in us, our love for others, assures us of that. The perfect love of God's people eliminates fear. Finally, he says in verse 19, where love begins. Again, he's been reiterating this theme throughout the text. We love because he first loved us. The perfect love of God's people begins with God. We love Because he first loved us. Here's what I know. I know that there is nothing that I have done or could do that would make my life and put my life in the right condition that God should love me. God's love towards me is unconditional, which means there's no condition that I've ever found myself in that says, Oh, yeah, this is the reason. I don't know if you've ever tried to do that resume thing with God. We're like, okay, I think this is what. Oh, do you remember when I did that, God? Surely that's why you love me. There's no condition that we've ever found ourselves in that would make us lovable by God. We never pursued God. We didn't run to him, but he, as we've sang, came for us. And so the love that we express towards one another and to the world is rooted in the reality that God loved us when we were unlovable. God loved me when I was unlovable. God loved me when I claimed to be a Christian and defamed his name with just about every activity of my life. He still loved me when my heart, when my life was in that condition. And he drew me to himself And he showed me that love and he showed me through the power of the spirit who Jesus is and what he had done for me and the work that he did on the cross on my behalf. He led me to believe. We love because he first loved us. When we are overwhelmed, I pray, brothers and sisters, that we would be overwhelmed, confounded. It would be an amazing thought to us that God could love us that much. And when we are overwhelmed by God's love for us, when it is something that we can't even begin to fathom how and why and the depth of God's love for you, that is when loving others becomes much more simple. We love because he first loved us. And what happens is, as we do that, the perfect love of God extends from us, his people, to the world. Look at this cycle. I want you to just remember this. See, God loved me, loved you. If you're in this room and you call yourself a child of God, God loved you. You know that he loved you. That changed your life. That love 
won you to himself and you became the people of God. And as the people of God then love one another, as we love one another in this room, as some of you are looking in and curious about why we do the things that we do, that love is confounding to you. You've experienced that love maybe outside of this room and other places as we've done life together. You've experienced that love of God's people. And that love has led you to believe that God is real. Because you've seen the love of God's people, you now have a confidence that maybe God loves you. And you become the people that love one another. And so you love other people. And then those people become God's people and they love the world. And then God loves them, loves people, loves the world, God. And this cycle just starts to spin like crazy out of control. As our love for one another spreads and it becomes contagious. Why are we planting a church? We're planting a church because there's more people that need to see and experience the love of God's people so that they might know that God is real so that they could become God's people and then they could love one another so well that they would lead other people to believe that God is real and that they could come into relationship with him and become God's people and then they could love others well and that thing would just spiral. That's why we do these things. Why do we gather? All the things that we do are to demonstrate that we know how much God loves us because of how much he has loved us, because of the unconditional love of God, we love. We love like Christ's love, with patience and kindness, not envious or boastful, without arrogance or rudeness, not insisting on our own way, not in an irritable or a resentful way, not rejoicing at the wrongdoing, but rejoicing in the truth of who Jesus is. Loving in an enduring way, bearing all things, believing with hope in all things, not allowing love to ever end with us. That's how we love, and the world has changed because of it. I hope you know this love. I hope you've experienced that love. If you can stand, we're going to respond by singing of the goodness of God. Remind your heart right now as we sing of his great love for us. Thank you.